it's been what it feels like 600 months this podcast has been coming finally we get the deal done we have jeff cobb on the podcast lars i tell you what when i reached out to jeff and jeff's like uh first of all why are you emailing me he goes lars from rancid i go yeah he goes i'm absolutely in i he goes i'll wait until i get onto the podcast but i absolutely love rancid and uh jeff whenever someone you know emails me back and says wait wait lars from rancid i get a smile on my face because i know those are going to be the best interviews ever so uh lars frederickson a here we are finally back again uh episode two after your uh, what is it the invasion of the uk welcome home my friend well, thank you. I'm just getting over this this cold. I had to go on a, on antibiotics for. I got I got every time I feel like I go there, I always get the death flu. And I don't know. I know you travel a lot, Jeff. Um, I mean, does that happen to you? I mean, does your body wear down like that? Do you catch like sinus infections and crap like that because you're flying so much? You're in different places, different days. Uh yeah, I've gotten better to where um, you know I just load up on like a bunch of vitamin c uh while i'm traveling uh some multivitamins and whatnot and i just try to try to be as healthy as possible especially on the first couple days um and while i'm traveling just to just to fight off whatever because i mean you know plane's not exactly the cleanest place on earth and you're and you're stuck in it for x amount of hours with all these other people so you never know what they got so you just always just gotta try to as much as you can for yourself for sure well i'm just happy to be back <laughs> and happy to be uh, be here with you, the three, uh, the two of you guys tonight. So, Dennis, kick us off, bro. Listen, first and foremost, we kind of teased it. Here we are, Jeff. Uh, you are a Rancid fan? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I don't want to date myself or <laughs> Lars here, but uh, uh, I was in middle school at the time, and my older brother, uh, he's about ten years older than I am. Uh, he was. Uh, he was. He's a music. Uh, he's got. The musician genes uh so he he played drums bass he sang um in like just local bands around the area and um i didn't get that unfortunately so uh, i tried i failed horribly so i i stayed away from the music uh side of it but my brother was into all these like uh, i mean i don't want to say like, just not mainstream artists like he would always show me like uh like give me like cds and say, hey listen to this hey listen to this hey listen to this like uh, I remember, I remember one time he gave me like an Operation Ivy CD, and when I was like in you know in middle school, I was like, oh, yeah. no, I like I like whatever's on MTV kind of thing. Uh, then he gave me he gave me this one CD, and it was a uh, and out come the wolves, and I was like, oh, this is a this is a dope CD, man. So like stuff like just since then, I've just been just trying to listen to whatever. Like my brother was my brother had a very good uh, ear for music, so. Uh, he definitely uh, introduced me to Rancid, and it was it was wonderful, man. That's very cool. So, um, you know, one of the things I was always wondering about, because knowing that you're from Guam, and you know, you entered into the professional wrestling ranks, did you think that the amateur part of your wrestling career, you know, because you obviously went to the Olympics, represented Guam for the Olympics, do you think that played or helped you in any way in professional wrestling? Um, I definitely feel it did. Um, when I started professional wrestling and then I had all these uh, trainers like telling me, like, you know, they're telling me back in like the sixties and seventies and even prior to that, like a majority of the pro wrestlers had like amateur wrestling backgrounds or mm-hmm. really accomplished amateur wrestlers. Uh, so I, I mean, that's what got me into amateur wrestling was I thought it was actually pro wrestling uh, in high school. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know any better. Again, like, like my brother got the good genes. I got the weird, the dumb jeans so uh yes yeah, so i thought uh you know amateur wrestling was pro wrestling uh, just on a smaller scale and i showed up and was horribly wrong and <laughs> but i mean i definitely feel like having that background helped me uh in in my field right now just just from the i mean not just the physical side of it but also the mental side of it because like amateur wrestling is one of probably the one of the hardest if not the hardest uh, sports out there for sure I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I was a fan of yours before I even knew who you were when you back in your Lucha Underground days and out came this tank of a guy. And I'm like, 
I like this guy. Uh, a few years later, I, I want to say, and I wish I did more of my homework here, but it was beyond you and Keith Lee. Um, I, I don't, the date of that match escapes me, but that match, I would easily put one of the top four indie matches I've ever seen. I didn't see it live. I'm not pretending to be like this poser guy that I was, I was in the crowd when you and Keith Lee beat each other from pillar to post, but Holy shit. All right. Uh, that match right there made me go Jeff Cobb's amazing. And from there on, I, I took notice of your career, which it almost seems like, and you know, this is rose colored glasses, revisionist history, maybe, but you went from, Hey, I'm, I'm a hardworking indie guy to boom. I just blew everything up. PWG. This mm -hmm. is the big Jeff Cobb guy for you in your career. Did it almost feel like an overnight turnaround from where, you know, you were sleeping on people's couches to go in. All right. I I'm paying for gas now. Um, yeah, it, it was, oh, well, cause I was, I started off doing indie stuff in, uh, in Hawaii and I was there for about, about four, steel three, yeah, about four and a half years. And, um, you know, I didn't really venture out into the mainland, um, or I guess the continental U S if you will, but, uh, uh, it was, you know, they were saying like, you know, if you want to get, if you want to make it, you can't be in Hawaii. Uh, just because it's so far away from her. it's a five hour flight to the west coast yeah. and you know and you know a lot of promoters aren't going to spend money on a guy flying from hawaii so just for like two or three shows so um i made the move to uh northern california and uh and for the first about three you know i want say three to four years i was you know driving everywhere i wasn't flying um you know i'd drive six hours down to la do the show drive six hours back uh sometimes for no money sometimes for 20 bucks in gas uh you know or jump in a car with three or four other guys uh, but yeah like i was you know a lot of people are like oh that's that's a rough life but you know i, I loved it you know that's uh, i mean i'm sure lars you probably you did that at the early stages you guys oh, yeah. too so i mean it's the cool part of it like you know, I got to bond with a lot of, I made a lot of really good friends um, who I still consider friends to this day, um, no matter, you know, how successful I am or whatnot, uh, that I can still call upon and they could be a hundred percent real with me about stuff. And I love that aspect of it. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't expecting to just all of a sudden, bam, get flown everywhere across the world and whatnot. And, and it just happened uh, pretty much uh, right after that, PWG debut but I mean it was it was very strange and I had to learn really quick how to deal with um, all these things like with booking and traveling and all this stuff and just being in a car for four and a half years and then realizing oh I get to fly now it's it's such a <laughs> strange thing yeah well you know you come over and you do the indie the indie circuit before you go to Lucha Underground if I if memory serves me correct I think you did a few indies here in the Bay Area, APW or Big Time Wrestling. I want to say it was maybe Big Time Wrestling show that I that I I think I maybe first saw you. So what year would have this been? Maybe. Um, let's see, well, I know I started APW in 2013 when I was at the uh, at the old Hayward Garage. Right, right, right. Because that, yes, okay, go ahead. Sorry. And then, then, and then I believe. I started maybe BTW, maybe 2015, I believe. Um, I got my little matchbook somewhere around here, but I, I mean, I don't want to look like a weirdo going through my notes and trying to figure out who, when I wrestled here. But yeah, it was like 14, 15 around that time. Okay, so you're, I mean, you're basically coming from Hawaii, you know what I mean? You, you got no family, I'm assuming in the Bay Area. Um, you know, first of all, like, how are you making ends meet? Like, you know, I know you're doing the indies when you can and you're cutting your teeth and you're earning your stripes, but how are you living at that time? Uh, well, I mean, when I was in Hawaii, um, I actually had two, two full-time jobs and because we only wrestled once a month out in Hawaii. So, I mean, once a month and then making $10 is not going to, it's not going to definitely <laughs> not paying the bills. So I had, I had two jobs out there. Um, and then I was able to transfer one of my jobs 
to uh, Northern California. Uh, I was working at a 24 hour fitness as a personal trainer. So like when I knew I was going to move, uh, I pretty much just stopped partying and just saved up everything I could and then had a little nest egg to fall back on. Um, Cause it was, it was definitely difficult that first year or two, just um, transferring to a new job. And then also at the same time, trying to like, okay, well, I, I can't do the weekends and I can't do Fridays and I might be late on Mondays just because I'm driving from LA or something. But I mean, that's just some of the sacrifices you got to make, you know? And yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I mean, it, at the time it definitely sucked, but looking back on it, I definitely wouldn't have traded it for anything. Well, the reason why I mentioned that, and I'm going to piggyback off this question is because you sort of cut your teeth and earned your spot, you know, because the last time I saw you wrestle was down in here in San Jose around Christmas time at the New Japan show. And you're a completely, totally different wrestler with a totally different persona, you know, and I guess the, 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 the part that I really wanted to hone in on, I mean, you, you, I believe Lucha Underground, you were wearing a hood, right? You were under a mask. Yeah. Okay, so that's three years of your life. And then you come out and you start doing the, the, the tag team wrestling and everything else. So how, how where, where do you feel you're at now? Like where in your character's development, what, what, what is inspiring you to kind of keep moving forward as far as with your character and reinventing yourself? Cause you've had to do it a few times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, like uh, when I was doing that mask thing, I was like, it was rough because I've never worn a mask before. Um, I like to say I have a face for radio, but um, <laughs> it was covering up my Dennis Farrell, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, but yeah, I, was, I mean, it was so strange because, like, you know, with wrestling, people want to see like your emotions on your face, and then being in a hood was or a mask is so strange. I mean, I mean, for the fact that I couldn't see as well, but just I can't look at an a uh, an audience member but it's a different character so it was it was it was hard at first it was definitely a learning thing and you know guys like conan and vampiro definitely helped me out um and then when we brought a when we brought a ray mysterio aboard uh he definitely helped me out with that as well because i mean pretty much 99 percent of his career he was wrestling in a mask so he gave me a lot of tips and pointers about you know how to do an emotion even if you're in a mask. So, it, mm. I mean, it's just, everything was just, it was a lot of on the job learning, um, not just for the mask, but like, you know, when I got this new character in, in New Japan where I'm, where I'm more, I guess, angrier. Like, cause I used, I'm always a, usually a good guy, and you know, right. have to go lucky. Cause I'm from <coughs> Hawaii, you know, Hawaii people, you can't get mad at Hawaii people, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, you know, just being, being angry all the time. And I, and it, it was perfect timing too, because like, um, you know, in my, in my personal life, I went through this huge negative change, which I just took that and used it for this, this new character. And it, and it's, I think it's working out perfectly. So. You, you seem like Jeff, a guy, and maybe I'm stretching here for a question but you seem like a guy throughout your wrestling career that never really got to settle down somewhere put roots down and make a place feel like home you're over in japan now do you are you starting to feel like maybe that's going to be your kind of home base of operation going forward or and and not knocking anywhere else or you kind of want to get back to the states in and revel in what might be the greatest time in American wrestling history, the golden era, as Lars likes to say right now, that we're in. Yeah, you know, um, I've when I initially started wrestling, you know, I'm sure everybody has everybody's goal is roughly the same was to make it to WWE, and um, you know, the few times that I had tryouts and the few times I had nos, and then like the last three years when I had a bunch of please comes, uh, you know, my, my ideals and everything changed to where I see the style and how it is wrestling in Japan. And I love wrestling in Japan. Like the, I mean, I watch old stuff from the eighties and the night, like early eighties, early nine, early nineties, even the two thousands and just the, 
the reaction that the fans give to the people. I mean, now it's a little bit different with certain restrictions, but it's still there. The emotion is still there. You can still feel them um, when you connect with them. And I love that aspect of Japanese wrestling. So, I mean, I pretty much uh, hunkered down and put my roots here for uh, the next few years, um, which is great because with the relationship that New Japan has with other companies, we are able to go to other places and and be showcased on there as well. So it does leave possibilities open for other companies. Well, do you find that, you know, obviously the, the Japanese wrestling is way different than the American and by, in Lucha and all that stuff. I guess the, what I'm curious is being a kid in Guam, you know, what TVs are you getting at, the, at this time? Where, like, where are you getting exposed to professional wrestling? What are you seeing? Who are the guys you're rooting for? Would you like to, you know, you know, give me a little bit of history about what television are you getting on Guam? Uh, well, when, so I was, half of my childhood was in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and we had WWF at the time out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they would come, um, I'll say like maybe two or three times a year to, to Hawaii for live shows. And I would always go to those. Uh, on TV, we, we had WWF. We had some uh, Japanese wrestling, but I never knew the exact time. Like it wasn't like always right. Mondays at this time. Uh, WWF was the only consistent one where they had a Saturday morning show as well as a, I think it was like Monday or Monday or Tuesday is like prime time. It was late at night, but I would find a way to stay up and watch a little bit of it. Um, and then they also had one on ESPN. I think it was Global Global Wrestling Federation or something like that. I know uh, uh, Sean Waltman was on it or X-Pac or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, he, was, he was on it. And I remember watching him as a lightning kid and I was like, oh, this is cool. So I, I watched those, um, but I also had a bunch of like wrestling magazines when I was a kid. Um, not just the WWF one, but like uh, the PWI magazines and oh, the yeah. wrestler. So I had, I spent all my money on that, on those things. Um, when I moved to Guam, we had pretty much wrestling, uh, I had wrestling magazines and the WWF was on TV and WCW was on TV as well. So I had a lot of wrestling to watch and keep me busy pretty much. So it was great. I, I'm trying to think of which way I want to go here because part of me wants to ask what's what's the wrestling culture like in Guam. Part of me, I've, my head's spinning now uh, because of that answer. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll ask this: uh, you, Hawaii. That's kind of where you cut your teeth, or not Hawaii, but yeah, Hawaii was where you cut your teeth in in growing up and learning how to wrestle. Uh, in in you know in America and probably everywhere else, there are certain areas like if you're a a bar band guy that plays a guitar on the weekends, you can make a nice little living and be happy and you don't really have to work where if you did that anywhere else in the United States, you'd probably have to have a job a, in Hawaii. How, how's the wrestling scene out there as far as fandom goes? Um, they were, it was really like, it would, it, I mean, with everything, it kind of goes like in waves. Like I remember early 2000s it was huge there was uh i believe three wrestling promotions in hawaii at the time um and i would see that just like when i'd go visit my family or whatever uh there's three companies one had ties to new japan actually because they would always bring in new japan guys um like masa chono and jushin liger and tiger mask they would come over and do shows um and then when i came back after i finished college there was two companies running and one was, I mean, I don't want to curse too much on this, but one was the shits. And then the other one was the, the main one that I started in and they were doing, I mean, they weren't, they were in a, in a downtown at the time. Uh, they were running shows where like maybe 20 people, 30 people show up. Um, and I definitely don't want to toot my horn or say as my, it was because of me that we started growing, but when I came in and then a bunch of other people started coming back and coming in as well. And then it just kind of made that made the scene so much better. And then when I left, uh, we were doing a good consistent, like three to 400 people on, on average a month. And then like, wrestling was starting to do like an upward, like a, like an upward pattern. And it was, it was doing good when I left and then the pandemic hit and kind of just derailed everything. But 
yeah i mean it was a, it was a good uh, good amount of people were coming to his shows good fan base well you know when i was a kid we had polynesian pacific championship wrestling with high chief peter Maivia. you know what i mean lars sanderson and i actually saw a live show actually at the same in the same building where you where new the new japan show was the san jose the civic there and um was that promotion something that you were exposed to? I mean, this was the 80s, so I'm dating myself like you dated me earlier, but we're all good right there. But so, I mean, I must have been about, I think, 12 or 13 when I saw that show. But what, was that promotion still going? Uh, it probably was. I just, um, at that time, as a kid, I never knew what, uh, if it wasn't WWF, I right. didn't know anything of it. Um, except or besides whatever I read in the magazines and usually those magazines wouldn't cover local Hawaii wrestling it would always just be like you know like right uh, bigger companies in in the mainland so I didn't really I didn't know any of that stuff until like after I or when I started training when people were telling me about oh this is how it was back then kind of thing so I wasn't really exposed to it unfortunately but uh, I mean must have been a good time well, you know, Bill After probably wasn't getting to Hawaii very much. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> he Bill does have a good time. <laughs> so you're, you're New Japan. You are killing it. Uh, I, I want to say, was it uh, 2019, 2020 maybe? I uh, turn on AEW. There you are uh, wrestling John Moxley, which was a, a phenomenal match. I, I think because I'm not a dirt cheek guy, I don't keep up on a lot of stuff. I'm like, Jeff Cobb's going to be all elite. And I, I don't know what your contract status was at that time, but was was kind of the all elite thing. Just say, hey, I'm in town. I have an open date. Uh, you know, I'm guessing you were still under contract with New Japan. And I think at that point they had a pretty decent relationship. Or, or, or did you go in with kind of the hopes of, hey, you know what? I'll lead, I'd like to get my foot in the door. Uh, well, it was 2020, uh, okay. right before the pandemic. Uh, I was actually a free agent. Uh, mm. My ring of honor contract ran out January 1st. Um, couldn't really come to a new agreement. So I kind of just went my way. And, but my heart was, I wanted to sign with New Japan. And um, so that's the route I wanted, I was going to take. Um, they weren't doing any contracts at the time until I want to say like March. So I had a good two, three month run as a, as a free agent, which is weird, but it's not weird because I, I mean, I came from the Indies, so pretty much I was a free agent then. So, and then the A, the AEW thing kind of came aboard. Um, originally I, I think I was talking to Cody, uh, when he was there. And he wanted to do something like a, like a, like a short term, like, I don't know, like maybe 10 shows or something. Um, and which is fine. Like, I mean, you know, they, they were still kind of, you know, finding their legs to their, their company and whatnot, and, but they were doing great stuff. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm all aboard. Like a lot of your guys I've known for a long time. Um, so it's not like I'm coming into like a, a foreign territory. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I just, you know, who doesn't want to wrestle John Moxley on a on national TV, right? So, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I just, they said, you want to come in for these things? And then uh, after that, we'll bring you back for, it was like April, April, May, and June. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, fortunately, the pandemic hit and none of those things came to fruition, but oh, well, so is life, right? You know, we've had Rocky Romero on here a few times. And I always want to ask him, and I can't remember if I have or have not, but the locker rooms and the difference of the locker rooms when in an American promotion, a Japanese promotion, um, where do you find yourself more, most comfortable? Um, well, it, de it all depends. Cause like we're, you know, like, uh, they keep, um, different factions and different locker rooms over here in Japan. Yeah. Um, you know, bullet club has a locker room, uh, new Japan guys have a locker room. Um, Myself being a part of the United Empire, we have our own locker room. And so everybody's kind of separated. But uh, like in America, it's pretty much like a, 
well, I guess it depends on uh, if you're on an indie show. It's like pretty much you can get whatever space you can get. Right. Uh, but like AEW is usually running uh, big venues, so they always have space for people, and there's all like you're never crammed in when or well, at least when I was at AEW, like there you weren't crammed. You had space, and and it's pretty much you just kind of you know I I got there early, so I just dropped my stuff wherever, and whoever kind of floated around, I was like, oh hey, but. I knew a majority of them anyway. So it was, it was a cool camaraderie. So yeah, but here in Japan, I stay in my locker room and then go warm up and work out before the shows and get ready to rock and roll. Do, do you still get the sense as kind of, we've said a few times on this show, maybe even this podcast, Lars and I, that right now, at least in American wrestling, it's the greatest time ever with AEW, the indies, you can make a living being an indie wrestler here. The fandom is off the charts. It's just everything here in the United States is amazing. Being over in Japan, do you still kind of get that sense that that it has spilt over to Japan, the fans, uh, other promotions in Japan, ever that the, the fandom in both areas are still the same or, you know, it peaks and valleys and right now United States is up here, but Japan's catching up. How does that work over there with us here? Um, I think it's definitely peaks and valleys. Um, like in the past, like for the past two years, like uh, there hasn't been any new visas issued. Uh, just like the government here is pretty strict about a lot of things. And it's, I mean, people will criticize the government, but at the same time, it's like, well, I mean, you're not running a country, so like, <laughs> don't 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 criticize, man. Like, it's, I mean, it's it's easy to be on the outside saying, hey, they should just stop these mandates or whatever. But I mean, like, I'm not on the trenches, or no, I'm not in there in the trenches fighting with all these different agencies and government. So I don't want to get involved in that. But um, so it's a little bit slower on the Japan side, but it's definitely better than it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, whereas now, like, with the attendance is going back up. Um, I mean, they're still doing the mask thing, but the attendance is going back up. And then now I believe hopefully the visas should be good soon. Um, I'm not sure when, but uh, I know they're, it's a promising thing right now. And we're now we're we able to cycle out some talent, like, bring some uh, Japanese guys to America and bring some more American guys to Japan and, and just like a nice little how it was in the before times. Um, but I definitely, I mean, I can still see the buzz that's going on in America. Uh, I mean, with social media, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, I see all the cool stuff that's going on over there and I'm happy for it because, you know, pro wrestling is a beautiful sport and it should be, it should have, amazing platforms that they are on now and i'm and i'm happy to be a part of it so i'm, I'm excited and then i'm excited to get back over there and get thrown into the mix down there and see some of the new up-and-comers that are, are killing it right now on the scene well you're a very agile wrestler and you're you're playing the role of this kind of monster heel like in the in the in the vein of and when i think about you know the americans who've gone to japan you know, the guys like Terry, Terry Gordy or, or Dr. Death or Stan Hansen. That's the kind of vibe I get and I see kind of with you. And I know those are very, once again, dating myself. But I mean, it's like when you do comparisons and you see certain things and new wrestlers, even though you move more like a Bam Bam than, you know, whatever, than just a, a Dick Murdoch, let's say. But um, do you like playing the role of that monster heel? Um, do you what part of that um are you get are you are you are you enjoying be being a heel and playing that role um yeah i'm loving it just for the fact that i get to beat up everybody <laughs> uh, i mean this is great i just beat people up left and right and then uh then have a little uh have some have some uh yummy steak after the show but <laughs> i mean other than that it's 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 just it's fun like all right like I said, second I, question I, how many potatoes are you thrown <laughs> oh man um not too many because uh, i've seen some punches that you've done recently and man 
I don't want to be on the receiving end, worked or not. You know what I mean? Well, if they, uh, if I have been throwing potatoes, uh, nobody's <laughs> told me, so that's good. <laughs> Maybe because uh, sure, you're I'm a big sure. monster heel, so they don't want to get on your bad side. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure they would say something, because. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, I don't think I have. I'm gonna knock on wood right now, so just in case. <laughs> I don't want to jinx myself for later on. Right. You know, Lars touched on it earlier, and it's a question I probably, if I was a great professional podcaster, I would have piggybacked off of it. So now, you know, 20 minutes later, we're going to circle back. But do you put much thought into the evolution of the Jeff Cobb character, where you want to take him? Now, and I, I guess I'm talking like it's a different persona than you are, but I'm assuming you're not – a hundred percent like your on air persona. If so, I really want to be friends with you and have you hang out with me when I go drinking. But uh, <laughs> and then I would talk shit to everybody. I would try to steal every guy's girl. I'd be like, oh, really? You got a problem with that? Meet my friend Jeff. Uh, he'll he'll step in while I talk to your girl. But uh, do you think about the evolution on how you want to take your persona, your image, your ring music, all that kind of stuff going forward? Uh, yeah, because like, I mean, I don't want to do the same stuff a year from now that I've been doing the past year and a half. Uh, so, but I also don't want to have a, a giant, I just want to throw 10 new things into one, you know, I want to space it out over time. Um, that way, it's never, this it's never boring, if you will. Um, so, I, you know, just like, adding a new thing here or there, um, try it out for like a little bit, and then add a new thing and then add a new thing eventually. And then just over time, hopefully it just adds a little bit more to the, uh, the overall package, if you will. And, and like I said, like, if I'm just going through the motions, I probably will retire just because <laughs> it's, it's not fun anymore. Like I, I want to have fun with what I'm doing, you know, like I don't want to get beat up if I'm not having fun. So when you kind of came in to the TV, you kind of took the world by storm. And even though you were in a mask and everything and you were winning belts and you were doing, you know, you've been, you, 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 you've done your time. So is that something that you put any importance on holding titles or, um, you know, it, does that equal success for you? Um, or is it a pain in the yes ass and you got to carry carry the thing yes. around with you uh yes and no um case in point there was a there was a time where i had three championships uh, i had the ring of honor television championship the pwg uh heavyweight championship and then um the apw heavyweight championship and having to carry those three belts uh as much as it was an honor to do it sucked for my carry on um because i dare not put it in a check-in bag for no. it might go missing and i'm stuck with the bill so i would always carry those three belts in my carry-on and man that oh i think i went to like two two carry-on suitcases in that in the span of a year so yeah and that's not fun either so uh i mean it is nice to have belts um there are championships because it's you know it does show that like a company has put some uh, faith in you, but uh, I mean, I don't think championships should define your legacy. I mean, because you know, guys like Rowdy Piper didn't really have many championships, and he was amazing. Uh, right. Kurt Hen, I mean, granted, you know, Piper had like here and there, and he also had like like the Intercontinental Belt, uh, I believe, once, and then you know, like case in point, another one of my favorites is uh, Kurt Henning. He didn't really have the, the, you know, he had the Intercontinental Championship, but other than that, like he didn't have the W. So I don't think championships purely define you as a as a wrestler. Um, it is nice to have, but um, uh, I mean, you could probably ask me tomorrow. My my answer might change as well. So, right. but for the most part, carrying those belts sucks. But uh, yeah, I mean, if I have a championship, that's cool. But if I can still beat people up and people appreciate what I'm doing, then that's 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 fine by me. I guess I would also ask, um, as you get into the industry, your fandom probably melts away and you go from fan to business. And, you know, occasionally we'll ask guys this question and most of them give the, you know, I'll see a highlight on Twitter and I'll move on. But do, do you still 
watch as a fan? Can you even still watch as a fan? Mm, it. I don't know. I've I found myself watching older stuff mm. from a fan's ask from a fan's point of view. Um, like we're we had a two hour bus ride yesterday, um, and I was watching. Um, what came up on the, uh just random stuff from like a nineteen early nineties all Japan. Uh, it was just like a like a compilation clip, and I was watching it as a fan. Um, I don't want to say modern wrestling, but like some of the stuff I see now, it's hard to watch it as a fan. Like I see it from a wrestling standpoint, I'm like, oh man, what's he doing? Or like, it's not necessarily negative all the time, but it's just like I can't. It's hard because I'm in it now, but I think the older stuff I can definitely watch as a fan. Well, do you think the Japanese strong style is a little bit more pure in the sense that, because what I think you were alluding to is, and I have the same problem with, it's a lot of spots. It's not really about, it's about the, the whoa factor. It's not about actually the hook, line and sinker, which, you know, storytelling. So, and I feel like Japanese wrestling never w really went away from the actual storytelling. Is that is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, um, I've I've noticed that as well. I mean, gr I mean, granted, like you know, um, like New Japan as an example. You know, we we tend to do a lot of like the Japanese style, but then you know we we'll sprinkle in like a, there's a Toriyama match that's the it's a hilarious, but it's not every match that is like that, and then. We also have, you know, guys that can go crazy, like 100 miles an hour. Like the other night we had, uh, uh, actually, well, last night, uh, Shingo Tagagi and Will Ospreay had a, had a sweet moment in their, uh, their sixth man. Um, but it's not every match that it's like that. And I, and I like that because you can, you stand, I feel like you stand out more when all the matches aren't the same. And then it's all, and at the same time, like, as a as a fan, I think you can digest it more if there's only like one hardcore match on the show, one comedy match, one super spotty match, one hard hitting match, and I just feel like you can retain it more. And because like I mean, if I watch it like a what was that Michael Bay movie where it's just like explosion, 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 like all the explosions don't mean anything after a while. So I right. I mean that's just I mean that's just my opinion and my point of view. I mean is is it right? probably not is it wrong who knows but that's just my personal preference gotta add a lens flare in there too between an explosion with a michael bay movie just <laughs> i mean not that i've you know going back in in looking at your movesets your career you are a guy who's always evolving and they always said like a kenny omega you know uh he was phenomenal in Japan, and before he came over, they're like, oh, his, he won't translate to the American wrestling fan. We've talked about you kind of – that's where your roots right now are in Japan. Is, do you think about your style like, all right, will it translate in the future to the States? Or are you like, screw it, this is where I am now, I'm all in? Um, I feel – I mean – and. I mean, you guys probably see it as well, where there's, you could tell that there's different styles, like, like with, uh, like the style in Mexico is different than the style in, in Europe, and then the style in America is different from Japan and, and whatnot. Um, so coming to Japan, I have that American indie style, that right. American indie mindset, where it's just like spot, spot, spot kind of thing. Coming to Japan, I definitely had to do a 180 and not learn everything but um or not learn new things just learn how to do things differently and i definitely feel that uh being here has helped me because um i feel like when i was on the indie like when i was doing 130 shows a year or something on the indies you know three shows a weekend i was doing indie style matches three times a week and that's that gets pretty rough on your body after a while. Mm -hmm. um, and then coming to Japan, learning how to not do crazy stuff every single match. Because these guys are wrestling uh, roughly the same 
same or probably more times a year than what my schedule was in the Indies. And mm. you also got to remember, like some of the guys are 50 plus years old. Right. So I'm, I learned quickly how to have longevity throughout my career as opposed to have a high spot, high spot, high spot, and only have a 10 year career when, you know, I'd want a 20 year career and learn and want to learn how to do not just the moves, but the emotions of it as well. Well, you know, there was some big news, obviously, in the last week with Tony Khan purchasing Ring of Honor. And now it's like, you know, we're going to have basically a wrestling fan and an archivist really, you know, it, it, it was kind of, you know, when I heard that, I was, I, was, I, I was actually pretty happy because I knew that that stuff wouldn't be chopped up, rebranded and filtered out like the WCW stuff on the Peacock and, you know, whatever in the ECW stuff. But I mean, how do you personally feel about that? Because I mean, here is a wrestling fan who obviously started his own wrestling company that's now one of the biggest, if not the biggest, well, obviously it's not the biggest in the world because there's still the WWE, but it's it's a very close second, let's just say. But I mean, yeah. now he, he, he um, how do you feel about a wrestling fan, you know, owner of a company, you know, now has all of these old matches that you do, that you've done, and that's a lot of your history. I mean, that's gotta be a good feeling that, you know, it's gonna be in good hands. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I mean, I see it from both sides uh, about WWE not getting the Ring of Honor stuff. I mean, cause you know, like people are saying, oh, well, WWE is gonna do this and that. And, but I mean, they did take the WCW library and they put it up on their network. So, I mean, you can still see WC, WCW stuff. I mean, it's not like they, I mean, I, I didn't really watch too much of it, but they didn't really rewrite history too much in that aspect. Uh, would they have done that with the Ring of Honor stuff? I mean, who knows? I mean, because it's not going to happen, but um, I mean, but as far as like Tony Khan owning, that's great because like you mentioned, he is a huge wrestling fan. Um, so. I'd assume he wants to keep it to where fans can see this and, and have it readily available. He's like, you know, oh, what if I want to watch a 2005 Ring of Honor match between so-and-so and so-and-so, you know, hopefully it's available for people to see. And he has a great platform to showcase that, which is great. So I'm, I mean, I'm excited and I'm happy that, you know, it's, it's going to be around still. Your your way of thinking, this is a, you know, Jeff Cobb, what's your opinion? We are all kind of that age where, you know, it's almost like playing baseball in the backyard where you wanted to be a major league baseball player or you throw the game winning NFL touchdown. You're you're playing wrestling with your friends. You we all thought, oh yeah, you know, WWF WrestleMania slam one, two, three, I win. At what point in your thinking when you're in the business do you stop thinking that, hey, if I'm not in the WWE, I'm not successful? And it seems like now in the last couple of years where you don't have to go to the entertainment, you don't have to go to New York to be successful. There, You can make a living on the indies, but in your mindset, you know, everybody still wants to go to Major League Baseball. But you seem like a guy who's they've knocked on your door a few times, you've turned them down. At, at what point did you get to, to comfortable enough to say, hey, I'm going to be an amazing wrestler, even if I don't have this on my credits? Um, I, I think it was around my, right after my first tour of Japan, mm. um, where I was like, <clears throat> you know what, maybe WWE isn't for me. And which is weird because the 30 plus years prior was all about, oh, well, I need to go to WWE or right. WWF. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not knocking and I definitely have a lot of friends that are there now and I you know, more power to them. I would not knock them for anything. Like there's so many people that just knock WWE for everything. And I'm not one of those guys because, you know, I'm, I'm not going to knock. I'm just, why would I knock something that's, you know, providing for a lot of, a lot of people that I know personally. Um, but I just feel like for me, it's just, um, this just not me. It's just not for me. Um, you know, people are like, well, you know, I, I asked this to a bunch of people as well. 
um, I want to say like maybe like two, three years ago, or actually probably in the last year or two was, you know, is my career defined if I don't go to WWE? Um, like, is it a failed career? And a lot of the feedback I got were people that were from WWE saying, or not, or not in there now, but like that have worked for WWE and saying, no, it, you know, they've been telling me that it, your career doesn't, isn't less valued if you don't go there. So, I mean, there's been a lot of amazing people that, haven't gone to WWE that are amazing Hall of Fame level wrestlers in the world. Um, you know, it doesn't take away real like I mean, Jushin Thunder Liger wrestled one match for WWE. Like, is his career does his career mean less? No. It's just he just chose not to go there. Um, so I kind of feel like the same would be for me. Like I, you know, money's not the end all be all for me, thank goodness. Uh um, you know, I've been very fortunate to where I can make a great living and not have to be there and still kind of do what I want. And I, I mean, you know, I don't want to, I wouldn't give up my free, my time for money, really. I mean, again, ask me, ask me tomorrow, I might change your mind, but, uh, no, I'm, I'm very happy where I'm at. And I feel, definitely feel I made the right choice with not going there. Well, I think, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, because I'm just a wrestling fan. I like wrestling, you know, whether it's the entertainment aspect of it or whatever it is. Me, I'm very grassroots, though. I like that Southern style. I love, you know, you know, the brawl, I, whatever. My point is, is that that creative freedom that you have has to mean so much more to you now than it ever did because you realize you can make a living right by just doing exactly what your natural talent is and uh i'm wondering like you know when you kind of alluded to it and that's why i wanted to ask this question you know here you are now you, you've made a, a pretty goddamn good career for yourself you've probably got enough money you, pr you probably got enough freedom um what's more important to you at this point is it the creative freedom or is it the paycheck? Uh, definitely the creative freedom. Um, I mean, I don't want to get too much into detail, but if I wanted to just chase it for the money, I would have signed with WWE last year. Uh, but I chose not to just just because, like, again, you know, money's not the end all be all for myself. Um, and it's not where I'm at in my life right now. Now when I f had my first trout in 2014, if they gave me a contract, I probably would have signed it back then just because I was at a, I was at a different point in my career and a different point um, just in my life. Uh, but, you know, flash forward was it six, eight years later, I'm happy I didn't go there. At, at what point in your career, did you become comfortable with being Jeff Cobb? You are uh, a, a, a different build than most wrestlers are. We, we, we can get into the racial aspect where you come from Hawaii. You're, you're, you're a little different of a color than most wrestlers are nowadays. You, you had to have felt like an outsider coming from Hawaii over to the States, trying to become a wrestler uh, with all these things. And, and, you know, look, wrestling's an aesthetic thing. People look and judge based on what you look like, I guess, a roundabout way of trying to get there. And that had to have been a mind fuck for you for the longest time. Was there a point where it did kind of fuck with your head? And then at what point did you go, you want fuck this. I'm Jeff Cobb. I built, I'm going to just do whatever I want to do. Um, not really, just for the fact that, uh, uh, you know, you know, I'm a little, I'm an Islander boy that's brown. So uh, I think I stand out in a, I mean, depends on what, what's, where you wrestle. Like, like when I was in Hawaii, like, like we're all pretty much the same out there because we're all Islander guys. Uh, but, you know, coming to like California, they definitely stand out. You know, there wasn't many um, like Islander guys out there. Uh, There's a handful of guys, but I mean, for the most part, there was few and far between. So, I mean, I think it was a advantage because uh, I wasn't, uh, I mean, I don't want to say a cookie cutter mold, but like I wasn't 
a generic wrestler A or B. Right. Yeah, I mean, I you know that's the thing uh, that I that I that I think makes you stand out is the difference with your body, the way that your style, the way that you have incorporated, you know, so many different, you know, obviously experiences over your career into what you are now. Um, is there any, is there something that you've been setting your sights on for a long time that you haven't achieved? Or do you feel like pretty comfortable where you're at right now? Um, definitely comfort is dangerous. Um, I never want to be complacent. I never want to be comfortable. I mean, I'm comfortable with where I'm at to a, to an extent. Um, I always want to improve. I always want more. I want to always want to set my sight on bigger goals. Um, mm. like for right now, definitely, uh, you know, uh, we're in the middle of a new Japan cup. Uh, that's something I definitely wanted. I want to win eventually. Uh, this year is looking really good. Uh, the G1 is definitely another thing I want to win. Uh, personally, you know, the whole championship thing, I would like to win. I, I had a, a brief taste of New Japan championship gold uh, three years ago and would like more. And case in point, going back to that, you know, carrying the belts around, the good thing about winning a belt in New Japan, uh, being here, if I win it, when I come back, I don't have to see it to the next show. So <laughs> I'll take more championships. Not a problem. <laughs> That's uh, I, that that cracks me up because we have had wrestlers on here that's like I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want the responsibility, I want to lose it. I'm trying to think, was Eric Young one of those guys that was like, no nah, man, so. you <laughs> keep, I'm all right, man. So the, the kind of to hear that story does crack me up because you 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 get the different points of view. Uh, as a wrestling nerd, I guess we can all say we're wrestling nerds. You you grew up a wrestling fan. You you were lucky enough to get in there. Uh, here, this is kind of going to be a dumb question, but I'm 44. I'm divorced. I'm starting to get out there. And when I talk to a woman, and uh, you go, "Oh yeah, what what do you do for fun?" Well, I host a wrestling podcast at 44. Uh, it tends <laughs> to scare women off. You're a young guy. As it should. Right. <laughs> but, but you know, and, and I got to thinking, because this just recently happened to me where, you know, she's into me and she's like, what do you do? I'm like, watch this link. And then it's just me and Lars and then a wrestler. And she's like, mm -mm, I'm out, red flag. Uh, for As you being a wrestler, because I, I don't know if you're in a relationship or not, how how is it to, to go, hey, uh, I'm Jeff Cobb. Uh, what do you do for a living, Jeff? I slam guys around. I'm a, I'm a pro wrestler. Is it hard to be a wrestler in single if you are and date around like that? Um, well, there's probably going to be a, there, there'll be a two part answer to that for, well, for one, <laughs> for the longest time I was always, not always, but like I was like growing up, like in high school and and like middle school and whatnot. And even in, in college, like I was always reluctant to tell people I was a wrestling fan. I wasn't embarrassed of it. I was just kind of like, oh man, like nobody's really, I don't think anybody's into wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, and like flash forward to like when I started training, you know, I look back and I was like, man, I was an idiot. Like, well, you should never be ashamed of what you like. Um, although I probably, well, it was probably adolescence but whatever yeah, uh yeah. that's what i'm going to chalk it up to but it's not I think at 44 the, it's not trust me <laughs> well never mind <laughs> but i mean i i feel like you shouldn't you shouldn't be ashamed of what you do and what you like to do um and if if somebody you know is like kind of interested and then you tell them what you do and they're kind of turned off by that then well screw them they weren't worth it i feel so that's my dating advice for you Thank but you. uh <laughs> <laughs> um, Flash, I mean, no, I don't think, you know, it's, it's weird. Like I know in, in America, um, a majority of the people that do date in, in wrestling tend to date within the bubble. Right. Like, um, and I always found that to be a, like for me personally, uh, definitely a red flag for me. Um, I mean, it's cool to have somebody that knows what you're going through with the travel schedules and whatnot. 
but then at the same time in the back of your head you see what goes on at these shows and and people that you know that are in a relationship that doesn't look like they're in a relationship and i'm not i'm definitely not gonna uh uh snitch on anybody because you know snitches get stitches but uh yeah like we're not editing of, this out yeah so <laughs> But some of the things you see, it, it, it makes it kind of hard. Like some of the stuff that I see makes it definitely hard to like be 100% trusting with somebody in the same field as myself. So um, I, I thoroughly enjoy dating outside of my circle and people that aren't privy to the wrestling scene. I wholeheartedly agree. Every every kind of any touch with any kind of musician or performer that I've ever come close to, it's it's no bueno, as they say. And uh, but um, I guess if I had a last question for you, um, where do you see yourself in ten years? Do you still want to be doing this? Do you want to get into the production side? Do you want to get into the um, producing side i mean you know you, you seem to have like a really good wealth of knowledge and you are very humble nice and if dare you know to to for lack of a better term you seem like a nice young man and i know that makes me sound really old but you do you got manners um and you're a really i can i can tell you're the salt of the earth but where do you see yourself like do you want to be behind the camera at some point or do you, will you always be just want, want to be one of the boys? Um, you know, I know people always say, you, know, you never say never, and you never, you never truly retire in wrestling. But for me personally, like when I'm done wrestling, like you're never going to, you're not going to see me on coming for a comeback tour or anything. Like I, when I'm done wrestling, I'm done wrestling. Like I don't want to, like, I'm not going to be hanging around till I'm 60. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I want a family, like I want family, I want kids. Um, and I don't want to, when I'm older, I want to spend time with my family and be able to, and, you know, being on the, like, I've been blessed to see this amazing world and different cultures and, and different people, but it's definitely taking a toll on my past relationships. And I don't want to, put that burden on them and you know in the future so when i'm like you know 10 years from now uh probably won't be wrestling uh but i mean you never know like never if know. i have a family and kids and then and then my wife or partner is like hey um college fun it's like ah shit i'll go back to wrestling then <laughs> but, uh that's my initial plans right now is like i don't want to wrestle when i'm done wrestling i'm when I hang up my boots, they're not coming back on. So, and so basically, what you're saying is HBO will make you keep wrestling. Like, if your spouse wants HBO, you're going back <laughs> on a road. Wow, that's I, that's what I heard out of that whole thing. Mm, Showtime, ah, crap, another tour. Okay, um, and I guess for my last question is in. Uh, you know, uh, we are, Lars and I are fortunate enough to know guys as friends outside of the wrestling industry. And I'm always curious on what 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 does Jeff Cobb do when he's not wrestling? What what does Jeff Cobb watch? You know, reality TV is Jeff Cobb a gamer? Does Jeff Cobb just live in this dark box? And when he's ready, to I bet wrestle? you. I bet you Jeff Cobb watches a little 90 Day Fiance. Oh, Jeff, I, I Jeff Cobb you. does look like a 90 Day You know what? Why don't, why don't we do this? Hold on, Jeff. You tell us. What, okay. You pick three shows that you think Jeff Cobb watches. I'll pick three shows that I think Jeff Cobb watches, and then we'll get the we'll get the we'll do a little fun, like a little. I think Hollywood we go squares. one at a time, though. You give me. Okay. I'll I'll go first. Looking at Jeff Cobb, Jeff Cobb strikes me as a guy that's like a. Uh, was it another 48 hours or 40 one of those crime shows where someone dies and then the, you know within 30 minutes they crack whether uh sally the homemaker was the one oh yeah 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 yes yeah. It, yeah. yeah, 48 hours yes no mm. okay then i'm gonna go with my original 90 day fiance no well that was a that was a little bit of a 
No. So, what? Every, okay, so I'm exposed. Give, right, Love after right, lockdown. I'll, wait, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to give you half a point. Uh, okay. Because I have watched Love is Blind. Okay. 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 That's okay. okay. But it's the same concept, pretty much. It is. Right? I'd it's give them a point. point. 90 Day Fiance, it's it. They have to get the K one visa, and they go either they're overseas or you know. It's really good. So Love Is Blind, I've just been turned on to that because I have a you know t- a girlfriend that who's ten years younger than me. Next, Dennis. <laughs> Peacemaker. I want to. I haven't seen it yet, but I want to. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm gonna go with. Uh, Vikings. No. Now, the pressure's on me because I need to get one to tie him. And if I yeah. don't, the game's over. If there's well, all you need is all you need is half a point, Dennis. Half a point. So I just need to come close. Arrested development. Not religiously, but I've seen I I watch a few episodes here and there. Is that a half a point? That, that might be. That all right, be. let's go one question overtime then. Okay, well, you know what? So, but I still oh, got wait, my you, third question. Yeah, that's right. I could, I could win here. I oh could God! Win. I'm okay. Let me think about it. Let me think. Let me this might be a new guy. podcast game, Lars, because this is kind of fun. I, this is <laughs> kind of fun. I'm gonna have to say, you know what? I feel like he's kind of old school. I feel like he he kind of binges like on Brady Bunch, the Brady Bunch. Not in a long time. Okay, well that so we're we're now it's now we got to do a, a, a heat. I can't believe so we don't got reality TV. Well, he a little bit of reality TV. So Dennis, you go first because this is the tiebreaker. <sighs> Otherwise, we're both both going home without the belt. See, oh, wait, here's the I, thing. Oh, wait, I will narrow it down for you guys. Uh, okay. So in Japan, my Disney Plus doesn't work. Oh, my, my Hulu doesn't work. Only Netflix. Okay. God, that's a tough one because now I, you know, because I was just going to go with what I thought was a layup. And be- why don't we pick a genre? Why don't we pick a genre? I think I know what genre he likes, and it's not rom coms. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to let you pick first because you're going to say Richardson. you like horror movies. I'm going to go comedy. Uh, I'm way more a comedy guy than horror. Ah, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dennis Farrell gets the first win. So uh, best of two out of three falls. I, I will say this, if you guys. Uh, I've watched, I started watching the most amazing show called Murderville. Have you seen that yet? Mm. Oh my mm. God. It's a Will Arnett. And it's oh, a. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Total, listen, Jeff, we're going to be best friends now. I, I've emailed <laughs> you enough where technically I'm a second cousin now. That's how much we've emailed back and forth. So as your second cousin, uh, I implore you to go watch Murderville. That is the most hilarious show. It's basically what it is: is that it's a situational comedy, but half the they have a guest star each week, and they don't know what's going on. So it's an improv show. Like the first episode's Conan O'Brien. Marshawn Lynch is the second episode. The Beast. Yes. Oakland Raiders, baby. Oakland Raiders. It it is the the most funny show you'll you'll watch tonight. Well, Jeff. While we still have you, where can people find you on your social media? Oh, uh, I'm horrible <laughs> at social media, but I have uh, Twitter, Real Jeff Cobb, because there's some fake ones out there. Um, That's how you know he's the real one that says real in it. <laughs> yeah, Real Jeff Cobb. Uh, I lost my blue check mark, though. It was crazy. Wow. I had it, and then I lost it. I don't know, but whatever. Um, Instagram. Let's not be New Japan fans. Yeah, I know. Uh, Instagram, Jeff Cobb. Pro Wrestling Tees, Jeff Cobb. <laughs> is there Pro anything? Jeff Cobb. <laughs> it's just well, all Jeff no, Cobb. So, well, the reason is, like, like I have, I can't remember my passwords. So I always, <laughs> try, I, I try to make everything the same. Like, all my right. passwords are roughly the same with, right. like, some need a capital, some need an exclamation point or something or a yeah, number. Yeah. So I try Wouldn't to keep everything everything the same because like man like oh it's rough it's a rough time to be <laughs> like the, this computer era is rough man i remember those days when i remembered phone numbers now i can't remember nothing so <laughs> face id <laughs> yep 
Jeff, hopefully you will not be a stranger to the show. You're one of the guys that we absolutely would love. Uh, if we were not in the show now, I think we could have gotten 20 more minutes just having fun with you now that we got to get to know you. And uh, I can tell you now, Lars and I, we can't wait to have you back on. Well, you give me a time, a date, and we'll play phone. We'll play tag for a little bit, and then uh, <laughs> you'll get back on. And well, listen, regardless, regardless, Jeff, I want to say it's a pleasure to watch you. You're a great performer, and thank you for all that you're doing for the entertainment value that we get to enjoy here in the United States of America. Well, thank you, guys. For everybody at home, the show is over. Leave for us. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. This was the Wrestling Perspective. Go subscribe, rate, whatever you guys do with your music and stuff. Thanks for letting us in your ears, but uh, go home now. It's over. See you later, guys.